And joining us now here on the program, we need an update on how this weather situation is looking here as we get into the first part of August. We welcome in Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions to talk about what is going on with the weather. Eric, thanks so much for joining us here today. And I want to back up and start with what we've seen here the last week. We've seen a lot of heat a lot of hot weather for folks and a decent amount of severe weather thrown in there as well, haven't we, Eric? Yeah, I'll be looking forward to seeing some of the new stats when they finally come out summarizing all of July because we had not only just a tremendous amount of hail in the last four days, but also just a whole lot of severe wind reports as well. So if you look at this map, this is just looking at hail fall streaks across the country. So you're just kind of getting a map here of those swaths getting cut and just take note of those, you know, two to three inch colors there. A lot of it coming out of Montana through the plains. And then we had the upper Midwest that was hit pretty hard. Parts of the Eastern Corn Belt hit pretty hard with hail. And again, what this does is just keeps ripping up parts of, of the main ag belt of the United States here. And uh, it was a pretty rough go of it. But you look at the rainfall that came with that and, and we start to say, well, you know, I guess it's a take the good with the bad, although the bad was really bad. But some places picked up a bunch of needed rain. I'm thinking about Minnesota, Wisconsin, northern Illinois, parts of Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. I mean, those were areas that desperately needed it. But just take a look at that map real closely there. There are a lot of holes in Iowa. There's a lot of holes in the Red River Valley of the north. And then the farther south you go into Oklahoma, Texas, uh, you know, parts of Arkansas, Louisiana, this past seven days was quite dry. And we expect it to stay very dry, especially in Texas going forward, which is going to continue to kind of send in our big heat wave. So, yeah, the recap of the last week showed just a tremendous amount of high impact weather events happening across the country. Well, Eric, let's put this into perspective before we move forward into August and, and just think about the last 30 days here and what we've seen throughout the month of July. Yeah, so this map really kind of shows us those vulnerable areas that are still in place, because if you notice, look at the, the deeper shades of red, especially in Texas or in the West. What about the Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa and parts of Illinois, and Missouri? So you have this big section here that has seen much more isolated thunderstorm events. And there are some holes in there over some big, big acres, which means if this upcoming pattern doesn't fill some of those in, especially in Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas, and then parts of Missouri, then we're going to start to see, you know, more on the downside risk in terms of yield loss. Now, something interesting to think about, this has been a weaker monsoonal year for the Southwest. And uh, the, the big snowpack in the winter was probably the, the cause of that. There's been a lot of research to understand this, but the heat's probably going to stay in the southwest and in the south over the coming days and weeks, which means those drier pockets that you see, they're going to continue to be a problem. But uh, if you go ahead to that next graphic, just take a look at the next 10 days. We're going to follow the ridge. It's going to be sitting in Texas to Arizona. Look at the northern side of that from Colorado coming out of Wyoming, go through Nebraska, Iowa. Missouri, Illinois, straight down to Kentucky, Tennessee. That is our best chances of getting an inch of rain in the next uh, 10 days. But take a look at North Dakota. See that really you know, red blob there? Late this week, starting probably on Friday, there is the potential, maybe it's even earlier than that, but there's the potential for a legitimate low pressure system to roll out of the Northwest. I'm talking about the time we get in spring or in fall, we're going to see it slow mover, go right across the Northern Plains in the upper Midwest. The reason why the Eastern Corn Belt stays dry is they just have too much drier air in place of this whole pattern. Also, before we leave this, there's just too much to talk about. The Canadian Prairie, extremely dry over the last week, except for in Alberta. And the forecast for the next 10 days is to be dry too. So this is this critical month of August starting. And those are all the things that are getting us set up in terms of precip at this point. Well, I want to talk as well, precipitation three to four weeks out before we talk temperatures. Mm -hmm. And you look at that pattern and it's looking okay, looking, you know, storms right around that northern ridge. What's it looking like as we get into the middle of August for precipitation here, Eric? So this pattern that we've seen the storm prediction, or excuse me, the climate prediction center really hang on to is largely driven by two things. We have a very weak southwest monsoon. That's why the Arizona and Mexico looks drier. We also have a bunch of very high latitude blocking. That's where there's big ridges in the Arctic. So the net effect of that is to drop a low pressure cell that's over the Hudson Bay or to the Great Lakes. And so what happens in between all of it? Storms. And that's why you've got this large area from Montana all the way to the Western Corn Belt that says above, and you don't see any drier risks really showing up throughout the rest of the corn and soybean belt. 
I'm worried about Texas staying hot. I'm worried about the drought that's already developed in Texas. But it's going to be a stormy August, I think, for a lot of us here. And the, S or the CPC, the Climate Protection Center, has been kind of the first to, I think, really hone in on it. So I tip mm -hmm. my cap to those guys. All right. Well, let's talk temperatures. And I want to get us to that conversation. Stress degree days. Talk about this a little bit. Yeah, so stress degree day is when you add up any degrees above uh, 86 for a given day and you start accumulating throughout the season. So it's kind of like a growing degree day, but instead you're only looking at the temperatures above 86. So if today was 90 where you are, you'd get four degree days. Got it? So we worry about some of the research done by Dr. Ellen Taylor out of Iowa back uh, after the 2012 drought. And he studied corn yield with respect to the accumulation of stress degree days. And so if you look at the map, <clears throat> everywhere that you have green, I have fewer than this value of 140 stress degree days. His research said you get above 140, especially on dry land corn, you start to see major yield loss. So there are pockets of Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, South Dakota that have already gotten above that number. But a lot of that was just a major jump from a week ago. If we look forward in the temperature forecast, we don't see the extreme heat sticking around in these areas. It's going to be warm. We'll get temperatures in the 90s but not the triple digit heat that far north. All the extreme heat is gonna to stay to the south in Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana and then into the Southwest. Texas, I don't think is gonna get a break from the triple digit heat into the foreseeable future. It's gonna stay very hot there. Well, let's talk about the next 10 days out. How are things looking as far as uh, that temperature outlook, Eric? Yeah, well, this map tells you what it is. Do you notice uh, Alaska? See how hot it is there? That's where mm -hmm. one of the big ridges is building. So if you all that heat going into Alaska, it's not going to be in the central U.S. It could stay south, as you can see here. Look at Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, just scorched 10 to 15 degrees above average. But the midsection of the country, most of the main ag belt, stormy and at times cooler. So if Alaska's taken on the heat and the Arctic is taken on the heat, we are not. Well, thinking three to four weeks out, uh, are things going to stay somewhat the same? Because I know I know a lot of people like myself are hoping that things can stay a, a little bit cooler than they have the last uh, week or so here, Eric. <laughs> yeah, well, this is that mid-August to almost end of August outlook from the CPC. And again, look where they have the heat. It's all south. It's, it's from Arizona all the way to South Carolina. And this is a very, very typical late summer El Nino look to the temperature pattern. And uh, could it finally mean that El Nino is fully engaged and taken over this pattern? There are some indications that that could be the case. What do we have to watch when you get out this far into late August? Well, we got to start paying attention to other things like typhoons in the Pacific recurving north or any tropical system in the Atlantic that could get going. But at this point, this next seven days at least, there is no tropical system in the Atlantic that's threatening the U.S. coast. They're staying way out to open ocean and nothing's brewing in the Gulf of Mexico. So all of those things come into play as we go our way toward the, you know, the second half of summer here. Well, Eric, a, a lot of things for us to keep our eyes on, definitely. Any other thoughts, anything else you're watching around the globe that we need to pay attention to as well here as we get into the month of August? Yeah, it's kind of crazy to say, but... Um, it's, let's see, September 15th. So what is that? 40, 46 days, right? Mm -hmm. They can start planting a crop in Brazil. Wow. So we need to watch the monsoon and we need to see if it's going to slow down the, uh, excuse me, we need to watch the El Nino to see if it could slow down the monsoon for a start this year. I'll keep an eye on that. Big storms ripping across parts of uh, Europe in the past week. And we did have a typhoon that hit China. Now, no joke, roughly half a billion people, okay, were influenced by this typhoon. And in and around Beijing, there were some places that measured over 20 inches of rainfall from it. Now there's another one sitting out there as well. So this could be highly impactful to international, uh, you know, crop production. So lots of things to be watching as we switch gears here and get past the middle of summer, start heading toward the end of it. Wow. A lot of things to watch for. I know folks can stay up to date daily. They can go to ag-wx.com and then they can also sign up for your weekly newsletter, can't they, Eric? That's right. It's a good way to just kind of make sure you've got it there at your fingertips to see what the weather's doing. We appreciate the time as always. Eric Stoggrass with Nutrient. Thanks for joining us here this week and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. See ya.